looking out over the water, today I'm reminded of another seaside community, Odessa, a port city on the Black Sea in southern Ukraine. Odessa is the third most populous city in Ukraine, a major warm water seaport sometimes called the Pearl of the Black Sea. Odessa was founded in 1794 by a decree of Empress Catherine the Great. Named after the ancient Greek city of Odessos, which was mistakenly believed to have been located there, Odessa is located in between the ancient Greek cities of Tyrus and Olbia, different from the ancient Odessos location further west along the coast, which was at present-day Varna, Bulgaria. Odysseus, also known by the Roman name Ulysses, was a legendary hero in Greek mythology, king of the island of Ithaca, and the main protagonist of Homer's epic, The Odyssey. Odessa is the feminine version of Odysseus, and while Odyssey means voyage or journey, it comes from a Greek word meaning full of anger or wrathful. While some modern Russian and Ukrainian nationalist historians argue that the Rus people were themselves Slavs, this is political propaganda as the Rus were the Scandinavian Vikings, a class of merchant warriors who are historically known as the Varangians, the name given by Eastern Romans to Vikings, mostly Swedes, who migrated to Northern Europe from Eurasia and the Middle East, stemming from ancient Aryan tribes, or some would call Israelites. On the left, we see the lion from the Swedish coat of arms, and on the right, we see the lion from the Ukrainian coat of arms, both with their tongue sticking out, clearly mimicking the same exact lion with the tongue out as the symbol of Jerusalem, the Lion of Judah. They arrived in modern Ukraine around the mid-9th century and kept an almost entirely Norse Aryan caste to the dynasty until the late 11th century. According to the late Swedish historian Ulf Henriksen, in his book Svensk Historia, or History of Sweden, the Norse Varangian guardsmen were recognized by long hair, a red ruby set in the left ear, and ornamented dragons sewn into their chainmail shirts. Odessa's oil and chemical processing facilities are connected to Russian and European networks by strategic pipelines, which understandably have made this part of the world very contested and a political hotspot. The rise of political nationalism can also be seen in a more subtle and thankfully less violent way through the graceful beauty of the flower crown, which means more than you might think. The recent surge in national pride in the Ukraine has generated a wave of support for homegrown designers and local production, and this includes the fashion front, where a revival of traditional Ukrainian folk clothing has been gaining traction, most notably the elegant flower crown. In Ukraine, it isn't merely a pretty accessory. The meaning of the wreaths traced back to Ukraine's early history, when they were associated with virginity, marriage, and womanhood, and have continued to be up until the 20th century. According to Professor Alexander Mialovich, who specializes in Slavic literature, in Ukraine and in Russia, both spouses-to-be wear crowns during the wedding ceremony, apparently continuing an ancient Greek tradition. In Ukraine, wearing the wreath is meant to signal the purity of a woman before marriage. So, not just an accessory, if an unmarried woman lost her vinok, as it is locally called, it is implied that she is no longer pure. To many Eastern Europeans, the traditional, spiritual, and virtuous values attributed to the vinok 
remain at the forefront. However, in a February 2016 article about the VNOC, Vogue wrote that all of this recent flower crown love is based in large part because this floral fashion statement has come to represent peace. In other words, the nationalism, at least in part, comes from a desire to peacefully express common solidarity and cultural unity rather than some sort of racism or isolationism. These symbols of beauty seem to have become more prominent after the 2014 revolution in Ukraine and regardless of whether it was because of something grassroots or ignited by external political influences, the Vinox seems to have evolved to symbolize to a growing number of Europeans, according to the model Nadia Shapoval from the Vogue article, tenderness. A beautiful symbol of compassion. In Europe, Swastika symbols can be found in catacombs, in churches, on plaza stones and graves, and can also be seen turning in either direction on ancient Greek and Roman artifacts, often minted on the world's oldest coins. There are those who believe the swastika originated in India. claiming its meaning in Sanskrit is good luck or well-being, but seem to ignore the fact that the entire Sanskrit language itself, including the swastika symbol, was introduced to India by Aryans on horses, famous for their chariots. Aryans, incidentally, is the name attributed to the highest level or nobility of the ethnic caste system that was imposed in India millennia ago by the Aryans, still visible today, both visually and according to genetic sequencing. Of course, one can also point to the fact that there are no horses in the fossil record of India, that is, until the Aryan invasions, nor a single depiction of a horse on any stone temple prior to the Aryan arrival which became common with the establishment of agricultural civilizations the Aryans introduced to the Indus Valley. John G. Bennett wrote a research paper entitled The Hyperborean Origin of the Indo-European Culture, in which he claimed the Indo-European homeland was in the far north, which he considered the Hyperborea of classical antiquity. This idea was supported by the Austro-Hungarian ethnologist Karl Penka, who wrote Origins of the Aryans in 1883 and proposed that Hyperborea was the golden age polar center of civilization and spirituality. Mankind does not rise from the ape, but progressively devolves into ape-like conditions as it strays physically and spiritually from its northern homeland. While this is in direct opposition of the current out-of-Africa hypothesis for human population dispersal, dismissed by some as Eurocentrism, especially those in the anti-colonialism movement, please kindly allow me to remind you that this idea was earlier proposed by none other than Bal Gangahar Dilak in his book The Arctic Home of the Vedas, published in 1903, who Bennett credits, by the way. In it, he argues that the Vedas could only have been composed in the Arctics, and the Aryans brought them south after the onset of the Ice Age. In his 1896 book, The Swastika, the Earliest Known Symbol and Its Migrations, Thomas Wilson, former curator of the Department of Prehistoric Anthropology in the U.S. National Museum, wrote of the swastika, and I quote, an Aryan symbol used by the Aryan peoples before their dispersion through Asia and Europe. This might serve as an explanation how, as a sacred symbol, the swastika might have been carried to the different peoples in which we now find it 
by the splitting up of the Aryan peoples and their migrations and establishment in the various parts of Europe." End quote. If you want to see just how deeply rooted the swastika pattern is in Europe, a good place to start is Kyiv, Ukraine's capital, where the National Museum of History of Ukraine has a small ivory figurine of a female bird. Made from the tusk of a mammoth, it was found in 1908 at the Paleolithic settlement of Mezin near the Russian border. On the torso of the bird is engraved an intricate pattern of joined up swastikas. It's the oldest identified pattern in the world and it has been radiocarbon dated to about 15,000 years ago. Which seems to support what Tilak said, who incidentally is the father of the Indian independence movement. So I would hardly call the man a colonialist. For those interested in my own personal view on the Arctic inhabitants and the Ice Age, please look for my book, Gods with Amnesia, published on Amazon.com. And no, the dog is not included. For those who would like to learn more about the Aryans of the Holocene, please check out Species with Amnesia, also available on Amazon, with a greater focus on the time since the Ice Age. An example of something I cover is what is commonly referred to in anthropology and geology as the Black Sea Deluge, a sudden abrupt event, geologically speaking, in which the Black Sea went from fresh water to salt water around seven to 8,000 years ago. And these people were the first agriculturalists or at least the nobility that managed and ruled over the first agricultural civilizations. They're flesh and blood gods with a small g. And they were also pastoralists, meaning they domesticated animals and raised them. And these things require water. The fresher, the better. Of course, not everyone around the Black Sea dispersed however, and here things take a twist, and as they often do, become very interesting. In Odessa, when someone's house settles oddly, or their water line breaks, or their pet goes missing, it's not uncommon for them to curse those goddamn catacombs. Underneath Odessa is the largest catacomb system in the world, with over a thousand miles of unexplored tunnels and a total length of 20 500 kilometers. That is more than the distance from Odessa to Paris. From the end of the 1700s on, people have been mining uh, and quarrying limestone out of these catacombs, both legitimately and illegitimately. The catacombs also became the preferred hideout of eccentrics, smugglers, criminals of any kind. And during the wars, especially World War II, huge groups of soldiers lived in these catacombs for, for over a year. In the 1960s, they became home to catacomb explorers. Every year, the founding catacombs exploration group called POISC, or The Search, performs a huge mapping expedition. Uh, they take 40 people below ground, they cook dinner down there, they spend four days underneath the surface of Odessa, and they map an unexplored part of the catacombs. But it's slow work, it's 10, 20, 30 kilometers at a time, which at 30 kilometers a year, they should be finished in about 30 years. The catacombs, of course, uh, for these explorers are dangerous places. Uh, in 2005, a group of Ukrainian teenagers went into the catacombs to celebrate New Year's. They were hanging out, they were drinking, and a young girl named Masha uh, wandered off and they couldn't find her. In fact, the catacombs are so large, they didn't retrieve her body for two years. The theory that our planet consists of a hollow or honeycombed interior is certainly becoming a hot topic, but is no way new. Some of the oldest cultures speak of breakaway or totally separate civilizations inside of vast cavern cities, inner kingdoms within the bowels of the earth. Could there be civilizations that inhabit inner earth? If so, do the subterranean catacombs that extend deep beneath Ukraine lead to any of those ancient hideouts or cavern cities described in so many myths and legends?
I decided to stop by at the Santa Monica Seafood Market and Cafe located at 1000 Wilshire Boulevard. Their selection is fresh and can't be beat. My waiter recommended the pan-roasted Baja striped bass served over butternut squash, roasted cauliflower, sweet potatoes, and finished with a butternut squash puree. It was definitely good, as it should be for the price, but to be honest, I think it was under-seasoned and could have used something spicy to go with it, but overall, it was very delicious. My name is Robert Sepper, I'm an anthropologist my published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.